All right, so um, I just sent out an email about this, but just to let you know, I did record a substitute lecture for the Monday lecture that didn't record properly, and I just now put it up on YouTube. Um, probably could use some editing, but I'll do that later. Uh, but it's, yeah, so it's up there now. And that's that, okay. So now I'm going to talk about two things that I didn't get to last time. Um, and the first one, and I think, uh, I don't know why I say this is more important. They're both pretty important. But so the first one is rhetoric. Now, um, The, I guess to introduce this topic, uh, I should point out that one of the things that Barclay is going to argue against Locke, or one of the objections he's going to bring against well, Locke, here. is he's going to say, um, sorry, I have to mute everyone. Um, He's going to say, hold on a second, not so fast. You say that we only use words to signify ideas, but actually we use words for lots of other things. Um, like, for example, <clears throat> we use words to excite passions in other people. Um, and in order to do that, it's not always necessary to to give them any idea at all. Sometimes the word itself already is somehow associated with the passion and that's enough, right? You can get them angry just by saying a word or, or some angry or some other passion. So um, whether that objection by Barclay, like how to understand it, I don't know, except I'm going to point out right away here, of course, Locke doesn't deny that we do other things with words besides communicate ideas. He just denies that those are proper uses of words. So that is, roughly speaking, he denies that language has other public utility than it's used to communicate ideas. Um, and that's why when he does discuss um, some of the other things we do with words, he discusses them in his chapter on abusive language. But um, still, you might... Uh, you might find that surprising if you think about it. Like, what is the use of language that's, as he put it before, serves as the great instrument and common tie of society? Um, isn't it actually precisely the rhetorical use that towards the end of chapter 10, Locke condemns? So in other words, isn't the use of language or at least um, one of the main uses of language by which it ties society together, the fact that uh, like orators can use words to excite passions in people um, or to get them to uh, agree to certain propositions or submit to certain laws or whatever, not by exciting ideas in them, in some rational way, but just by using words to manipulate them. 
Um, I mean, that sounds kind of sinister in a way, but uh, are we are we sure that that doesn't, you know, when done with the right intentions, have at least as much public utility as the use of language to communicate ideas? So I think to understand why Locke would deny that, you have to remember that, um, number one, he thinks that there's a natural order of our ideas. Um, so again, like, you know, um, this idea naturally leads to this one, which naturally leads to this one. And the use of words to express a demonstration is to put the words in an order corresponding to that natural order. So that the last word is the conclusion um, that you ought to believe if you accept the first word. I'll say more uh, in a moment when we talk about the new material about exactly what Locke thinks demonstration is and why this seems odd to us that the beginning and end of the demonstration are ideas uh, rather than propositions. But in any case, um, that's what, uh, that's how Locke thinks that language in its proper use can get people to accept certain conclusions. So that's number one. But number two, remember, Locke thinks, well, remember, I guess, I mean, he actually talks about that in the new reading, although I think I've mentioned it before, that Locke thinks that, um, in principle, ethics is just as susceptible of demonstrative arguments as mathematics. So if we really used our words and kept track of our ideas as carefully in ethics as we do in mathematics, we would have proofs in ethics that were as convincing and well as con sorry, that it were as rationally compelling as the proofs we have in mathematics. Or again, another way to get at this is that, you know, remember um, ethics or ethics properly speaking is about the divine law. Right? I mean, it's about the moral good and evil, but it's about the moral good and moral good and evil are relative to what law you're considering them with respect to. But um, because God is an infinitely powerful and accurate lawgiver, the divine law is the one that you really should be paying attention to. Um, so when you're arguing about what is, in an absolute sense, morally good and evil, you're arguing about what conforms to or violates the divine law. And the divine law is Locke also says the law of reason, right? So um, again, if you used your reason properly, you could demonstrate what it is that God is going to reward. You could, first of all, you could demonstrate that God is going to reward and punish things. And number two, you could demonstrate what things God is going to reward and punish. Um, so the right use of language in society is going to be always not just to arbitrarily get people to have certain ideas, which would be useful for them to have, but um, to get people to have ideas in the right order so that they will arrive demonstratively at the right conclusion about what they ought to do. And anything, any use of language to uh, excite ideas in a different order 
is um, a use of language to excite madness. And that's why um, when Locke discusses the um, art of rhetoric or, in, or generally speaking, the arts that uh, allow us to use language, quote unquote, well in some other sense um, than to express the natural order of ideas. Um, so he says, and let me stop share. This is book three, chapter 10, section 34. So it's right near the end of book three. Well, actually, there's a whole chapter at, at the end of book three that I didn't assign, but right near the end of the part I assigned. Um, but yet, if we would speak of things as they are, and I was just arguing basically why Locke thinks that the socially useful, uh, publicly useful, use of language is to say is to speak of things as they are that's what we need to know in order to take care of our own pleasure and pain so um but yet if we would speak of things as they are we must allow that all the art of rhetoric besides order and clearness all etc cetera, etc cetera, are for nothing else but to insinuate wrong ideas move the passions and thereby mislead the judgment right so it's all the arts of rhetoric except order and clarity order and clarity means getting this oops i, I erased i mean you can't see the board now but order and clarity means getting that natural order right that's the only um, part of the art of rhetoric that Locke is saying pertains to the legitimate or proper use of language. Oh, I lost that page, page 452. Now, however, I want to point out something at the end of this paragraph, which is really interesting, but um, I don't know exactly what to make of it. So um, at the end of this section, so Locke has just said that basically these arts of making language pleasant or convincing or whatever are um, uh, are all harmful. <laughs> They're not arts we should cultivate. But then he says, I doubt not, but it will be thought great boldness, if not brutality in me, to have said thus much against it. Now well, maybe I should start a little bit farther back. Tis evident how much men, so notice here, men, we think means human beings. Um, how much human beings love to deceive and be deceived since rhetoric, that powerful instrument of error and deceit, has its established professors, is publicly taught, and has always been in great reputation. And I doubt not, but it will be thought great brutality, if, uh, sorry, great boldness, if not brutality in me, to have said thus much against it. Right, so, so far he's saying, um, now this by itself is actually a little bit surprising, um, men, meaning human beings, love to be deceived. Um, and that's why even though rhetoric is obviously something harmful, people are not going to be happy that he's criticizing it. 
Now, um, being deceived, it's not clear how it's consistent with his theory of motivation that men or human beings love to be deceived. It must be that they somehow get distracted from the fact that in the long term that's going to cause them pain or deprive them of pleasure. Um, but in any case, that's what's going on, he says. So um, that's why it's very hard to criticize rhetoric because people love rhetoric because they like to be deceived. And then he adds, eloquence, like the fair sex, has two prevailing beauties in it, to suffer itself ever to be spoken against. So um, now he's saying just men like to be deceived just as they like to be charmed by women. And therefore, they don't want to hear deception criticized just as they don't want to hear women criticized. Now, I mean, leaving aside the question of whether it's true in general that men don't or haven't like to hear women criticized. Um, uh, what I want to call attention to is two things. First of all, he's shifted without noticing. I mean, he doesn't use the word men again, but clearly this is continuing that sentence that he said before. I mean, he's shifted the meaning of men from including women to as opposed to women. So he's taking advantage of that ambiguity that's always been in the English word man, um, or that there always was in the English word man. Maybe now it's finally losing it, and it just means man as opposed to woman, or as opposed to other gender, I guess. Um, so, uh, but um, but in this in the space of those two sentences, he took advantage of that ambiguity to convince you of something. And moreover, he did that by using a figure of speech, basically. So this is like a rhetorical trick <laughs> that he's using. Um, at the very end of the paragraph where he said that all rhetoric that's not in the service of um, clarity and order is to be condemned. So what that means both about uh, what Locke really is saying about rhetoric and also what he really thinks about men and women is that's where I'm not sure what to say, but it's, it seems like perhaps it's more complicated than meets the eye. Um, okay, that's everything I wanted to say about rhetoric. And I noticed, I just noticed there was a question. We count any simile as rhetoric then. Well, I mean, he, he definitely, as he goes through that paragraph, he includes in what he's talking about figurative use of language. Um, so I mean, whether that's to be called rhetoric or not, I think it's included in what he's condemning there. And uh, it's included, I mean, I guess you might say, no, this is not a figurative use of language. Rather, it's an analogy. Um, and that's different, that analogy does have something to do with the natural order of ideas. I don't remember him talking about that. I feel like he must somewhere. Reasoning from analogy is such a common topic. In any case, uh, um, I guess the analogy would only be 
really rational to the extent that it's really precise, and it never is. Um, uh, you know, so in this case, is the supposed love of being deceived really completely comparable to the supposed love of women? Uh, you know, to, in order to make this a possible demonstrative argument, I don't think it is. But leaving that all aside, the device of without you noticing it switching from one use of the word men to another use of the word men is which I think makes the analogy seem better than it is maybe um, is definitely to be counted as a rhetorical trick. Is that um, is that helpful? All right, maybe, maybe not. Okay, so I'm going to go on to discuss the other thing that I didn't get to last time, but that I really feel that I must mention, which is names of substances. I mean, it's kind of like intertwined with one of the things we have to talk about from the new readings. So I thought maybe I could just fold it in there somehow, but I didn't figure out how. So I'm going to discuss it on its own. Um, so, um, names of substances, by names of substances, he means, for the most part, names of sorts of substances. That's the type of issue he discusses. So this is really, as I think I said last time, it's like a subtopic of the uh, topic of general names in general. Um, um, but because of the type of idea that the idea of a substance is, the, na the uh, names of substances have particular problems or issues that need to be considered. Um, and um, the main thing to try to understand from what he says about the names of substances is the difference between the real essence and the nominal essence. So the nominal, of course, has to do with the name. <laughs> um, whereas the real essence, right, right, emphasize every so often, race equals things. So the real essence has to do with the thing. So um, um, these essences, these, when I say these essences, this is really, they're not really two different types of the same thing that are called essence exactly. They're two different ways that you might think of the essence of a certain sort. Um, and the essence of a sort is supposed to be the common uh, property by which we sort things into that sort. So like, what is it that makes something count as a horse or as gold or whatever? Whatever that is, is the essence of horse or the essence of gold. And these are, so to speak, two different ways of thinking about what that is. So, um, um, all right, well, let me just start with what he says about this in book three, chapter three, section 15. So I'm going to switch back to the document camera. I wonder if there's some other, I wonder if I could use like Twitch or something to do my, oh, oh, sorry, I don't know. Anyway, um, 
374. Right, so here he's talking about this sense of essence, the essence of a genus or a species, or as he likes to say, a sort. Um, and he's asking, okay, so what is the essence um, of a sort? Is it, um, should we think of it as the real essence or as the nominal essence? So, and this is where he introduces those terms. Tis true, there is ordinarily supposed a real constitution of the sorts of things. So the first thing he's saying is, we ordinarily think that there's something in the things, a real constitution, um, that makes them be of that sort. And then he adds, and tis past doubt, there must be some real constitution on which any collection of simple ideas coexisting must depend. And he says, well, sure enough, that's true. That supposition is true in the following sense. Um, suppose we've, we've formed a certain idea of a certain sort of substance, like the idea of gold contains yellow and heavy and fusible and soluble in aqua regia or whatever else we put into it. Um, if those things always go together, there must be something about the bodies that are causing those sensations in us, which makes those things always come together. There must be some real constitution on which any collection of simple ideas coexisting must depend. I mean, I guess you could say, maybe it's just a coincidence every time I see gold and heavy and all those other properties together. It's for some completely different reason and it's just a coincidence. Um, um, maybe he's counting that as one big real constitution, like it's either this or that or the other thing, or I don't know, or maybe he's just dismissing that as not something probable that we can believe. I don't know, in any case, um, what he's saying is, that generally speaking, and this certainly seems reasonable, if there's certain simple ideas that are always excited together, there must be something about the body that's exciting them that makes it excite those ideas together. And all those bodies that excite just those ideas together have something in common. So when we say they have something in common, of course, what, what do we mean? What kind of things can bodies have in common? Well, primary qualities, right? So that is, they can have a certain texture of their tiny parts. That is, their microscopic parts have a certain figure, bulk, motion, et cetera. Some fact about that explains some fact about the tiny microscopic parts of gold, for example, explains why it affects us with all those uh, simple ideas that we've put into our idea of gold. Um, but he goes on, but it being evident that things are ranked under names into sorts or species only as they agree to certain abstract ideas to which we have annexed those names. The essence of its genus or sort comes to be nothing but that abstract idea which the general or sortal blah, 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 name stands for. And this we shall find to be that which the word essence imports in its most familiar use. These two sorts of essences, I suppose, may not unfitly be termed the one the real and the other the nominal essence. So the, what's the nominal essence of gold? The nominal essence of gold is um, 
the abstract idea, which we have all consented to signify using that sound gold. Um, what's the real essence of gold? The real essence of gold is whatever it is about the primary qualities of certain bodies that cause them to excite exactly those simple ideas in us. So, um, um, Locke started out by saying, for sure, there is a real essence. There is something about the bodies that cause those ideas in it that they have in common that causes them to cause those ideas in us. But um, it causes them to, by virtue of which they cause those ideas in us. That's the real essence. But Locke says, we don't know that and we never will know it. Number one. And number two, he also says, even if we did know it, it wouldn't tell us how to divide things up into sorts. Because suppose we could see this microscopic parts of gold. And here's some other thing that has microscopic parts also. So um, these are going to have this texture, this like bulk figure, motion, et cetera, of microscopic parts is going to be the same as this one in some ways and different from it in other ways. How do we know which differences are enough to count as making a different sort? And Locke says, um, you could look at these primary qualities of the bodies as long as you want, and you never will find an answer to that. So what makes uh, what's the distinction between a substance and essence? Someone just asked. Well, they're not. Um, so the idea of a substance is the idea of a certain, is a complex idea that's composed of certain simple ideas that we join together because we suppose that there are qualities in here in a common subject, and that common subject is the substance. So um, the, the object of the idea of substance is the substance. So like the object of the idea gold, the idea gold is, I keep saying that it's yellow, fusible, etc., but it has that one other obscure part, which is the coexistence in a common uh, subject, right? So the idea of gold represents its object as a, sub, a subject in which the qualities that cause the ideas of yellow, fusible, etc., in here. That's what a substance is. Whereas what an essence is, the essence of a sort, what the essence of a sort is, is whatever it is that provides the standard by which we can sort things into that sort or not that sort. So they're not, I gave that really long answer because I don't, I mean, it's like, what's the difference between a raven and a writing desk? They're not really the same kind of thing at all. They're, even though it's true, they're both ultimately translations of the same Greek word, zia, but uh, if, if Locke knows that, he certainly doesn't make any use of it. Um, so yeah, so I mean, that's just distracting um, for these purposes. They're, they're, they're not the same kind of thing at all. Substance is a subject in which certain um, qualities adhere together, and an essence is a standard by which you can sort things into different types, according to Locke's definitions. Does that did that answer the question, or another question? A real essence. 
what's the distinction between a real essence and a nominal essence? That's what I'm talking about. But what's the distinction between a real essence and a substance? The real essence is, would be something about the substance. Okay, what's the distinction between the real essence and the substance? The real essence would be something about the substance which explains why it causes certain simple, uh, causes us to perceive certain simple ideas. So the, the real essence would be a, a, a quality, a, a complicated primary quality which inheres in the substance. Uh, which inheres in, in a lot of different substances. They all have it in common and that's why they belong to the same sort. Did, did that help? Okay, so, um, um, right, so again, we don't know what this real essence is. So we haven't really collected all the things we call gold together because we know they have the same real essence. And number two, actually, even if we did know everything about gold, it still wouldn't be true that we could collect all gold together because it has the same real essence because again the real essence is like a certain thing about all the things we have gold that that by virtue of which they all cause certain simple ideas in us but there are going to be other things that, that they're going to all be different from each other in other respects and there's nothing to tell us that um, that one is the one we should use to separate things into sorts so therefore, the real essence, um, I mean, I don't know how to put this exactly. There is a real essence, but there is a real essence only because there's a nominal essence. And moreover, we don't know what it is, <laughs> right? That is, if there were, so the, I guess, I don't know if I said what the nominal essence is clearly. The nominal essence is, the abstract idea to which we have joined the name gold. And it should be the same abstract idea in everyone if we're all speaking the same language. Although as Locke often points out, that's, we usually fall short of that, way short of it. <laughs> we don't all have exactly the same abstract idea associated with the sound gold, but it should be the same abstract idea and that abstract idea is the nominal essence. So it's called nominal because it's the idea that's associated with the name of the sort. Um, and that idea is the true standard by which we sort things into gold and not gold. We don't do it by consulting the real essence. We do it by um, going from the name gold to the abstract idea that we associate with gold and then comparing some parcel of matter that we have in front of us with that abstract idea. Do we perceive it as yellow and fusible and all that stuff or not? That's how we tell whether it's gold or not. Therefore, that's the, that's the essence that we're actually using. That's the, I don't wanna say that's the real essence, but of course that would be a super bad choice of terms here. That's the true essence. Right, that's, that's what's actually the essence of the species, gold, is that abstract idea in our minds. Because there is that nominal essence, there also is a real essence that is, once we've collected all those things together and called them gold because of that one abstract idea, if we knew about all their microscopic parts, we could figure out what it is about them really it makes them all similar in that respect. Um, so uh, there is some real essence, but it's only because of the nominal essence. If we hadn't collected those, just those things together, there'd be nothing to say that they all belong to one sort at all. And number two, we can't use that real essence because we don't know what it is. 
Um, um, I could, uh, and I think I have in some previous years, talk at length about the question, so is it different now? Now do we know the real essence of gold? And also, now do we know true sorts of things like electron or something uh, that are absolutely similar to each other? Or, you know, uh, but, uh, but in previous years when I talked about that, I didn't talk about anything else, so I will not talk about that. Okay, so um, um, as far as what Locke thinks about the, as things were in Locke's time, are there questions about this? Okay, so I'm going to go on to talk about the new material from book four then. So book four is about knowledge. And uh, just as the main thesis of book three, which was about words, is that words serve to signify ideas. Um, the main thesis of book four Let me switch to that. Just what sixty seven. Book four, chapter one. Section two. Knowledge then seems to me to be nothing but the perception of the connection and agreement or disagreement and repugnancy of any of our ideas. It's not completely in focus of this, but hopefully you can read this. Um, so, um, to put it, well, so in other words, just as book three says words are words for ideas, book four says knowledge is knowledge about ideas, and moreover, uh, um, in what way is it about ideas? It concerns the agreement or disagreement um, or the connection or repugnancy between our ideas. Um, I think that those two distinctions, agreement and disagreement, and connection and repugnancy are supposed to be synonymous for a long. I don't think he's in introducing two different sets of things that knowledge can be about. It's all about agreement or disagreement, or as you might also say, connection and repugnancy of ideas. Um, so, um, Seriously, you guys, you don't have to whisper. I don't think it's okay if you talk softly. I don't think we're going to be talking in a normal voice or not, but it's quiet. Yeah, I know. But I think it's okay if you talk softly. But anyway, um, all right. Um, 
Right. So um, all knowledge is about agreement and disagreement of uh, ideas. Now, um, when you first look at this, it looks like knowledge is going to be very, very limited. It's true that in the end, according to Locke, knowledge does come out pretty limited. He doesn't think that we're capable of very much knowledge. Um, but uh, it's not quite as bad as it seems. And it's not quite as bad as it seems in two respects. First of all, agreement or disagreement of ideas doesn't just mean are they the same idea or not. Um, that actually is going to be the first kind of agreement and disagreement, but then he lists three other kinds of agreement and disagreement of ideas. So, um, um, so uh, it's possible for ideas to agree or disagree, even though um, they aren't it's possible for ideas to agree even though they aren't literally the, the same idea and it's possible for them to disagree even though one of them doesn't uh, contain the negation of the other. Um, so or in other words in Kantian terminology Locke is not saying that all our knowledge is analytic. Um, and the other part is that although it's all about agreement and disagreement of ideas, and of course this means that my knowledge is all about the agreement and disagreement of my ideas, um, nevertheless Locke doesn't conclude from this that we can't know about anything except our own ideas. Um, how he gets out of that is maybe a little bit difficult to explain, um, but uh, I've already said something about it before when I talked about the primary qualities, and I'll try to say a little bit more about it now. Um, so, in other words, um, When Locke says at the very beginning of book four, I mean, what I said, what I read just now was almost the very beginning. Um, Since the mind in all its thoughts and reasonings hath no other immediate object but its own ideas, which it alone does or can contemplate, it is evident that our knowledge is only conversant about them. What he means is that it's only conversant about them immediately. Right? Our knowledge is immediately about our ideas, but just as um, the other operations of our mind, which are immediately about ideas, can by means of, by the medium of ideas, be also about external things or about the other operations of our own mind. Um, our knowledge also, even though it's immediately about agreement and disagreement of our ideas, can in principle be immediately about agreement and disagreement of things, or qualities of things. And so um, um, Locke is not saying that all our knowledge is analytic, and he's not saying that um, all our knowledge is purely ideal, that it's only about ideas and not about things. He thinks that we have some real knowledge, and that's even the title of one of the chapters. All right. So. Um, that's what Locke says knowledge is in general. Now, um, I'm going to stay right on this page here. Um, 
So that's what Locke says knowledge is in general, but because that's what knowledge is in general, there um, are going to be two ways of classifying all our knowledge into different types. And the first way is according to um, what kind of agreement or disagreement is involved. And Locke says again that there are four different kinds. And the second way is according to whether the agreement or disagreement is um, um, now, I'm going to say immediate again. It means the same thing, but it's confusing because immediate just means there's nothing, no medium in between. We're shifting perspectives here. Whether we know the agreement or disagreement immediately or by means of some other ideas. Those are the two ways of classifying all the knowledge that Locke gives. And apparently, at least to some extent, they cut across each other. So the one is the, this classification according to the four types of agreement and disagreement. And the other is the classification of knowledge into intuitive and demonstrative. In intuitive knowledge, we perceive the agreement or disagreement of the two ideas just by comparing them to each other. Whereas in demonstrative knowledge, we can only do it by putting some other ideas in between. I'll try to explain what he means by that later when I get, I'll give an example of demonstrative knowledge and how we understand it. But first I want to talk about that other classification into the four types of agreement and disagreement. And the four types are identity or diversity. Obviously identity is the agreement part and diversity is the disagreement. Relation, coexistence or necessary connection. Here the or, here the or separates the agreement from the disagreement. Here the or just tells you another term for the same thing. Coexistence or, in other words, necessary connection. And the fourth is real existence. And as you can see, one advantage to the fact that you're seeing my very copy of what that I scribbled all over, and you probably can't read it, I wrote next to these four things the title of the Kant's four titles from the table of categories, quantity, quality, relation, modality. Um, so if you're interested in Kant, you might want to remember that, but I'm going to try to avoid talking about it. In the past, I've spent a lot of time talking about how Locke is related to Kant on this point and the pure, Kant's pure concepts of reflection and whatever, but obviously that's not a good use of time in a class about Locke. Um, so I'm just going to go on and say something about what each of these four modes of agreement and disagreement are according to law. Are there questions about what I've said so far before I get into these four different modes of agreement and disagreement? Okay, so um, so the first kind is identity and diversity. Now, this kind of agreement and disagreement is supposed to cover examples like white is not black. We have the knowledge that white is not black because we can perceive that white and black are not the same idea, but are different ideas, that they're not identical, they're diverse. Um, Identical here means, it still means the same as it always does, but uh, of course the question here isn't whether they, um, they are literally the same idea looked at twice. Um, that is, I mean, there couldn't be a question like that. 
for the usual reasons, you can't ask whether something is the same as itself because it just is itself, right? So if I were just looking at the idea of white in my mind, so to speak, um, I couldn't ask, is it the same as itself or not? What comes with it is the idea of unity. And if you like, you can call that self-identity, but that's really misleading because identity is a relation and unity is not. It's just one idea. So when he says, when he asks, when we ask whether ideas are identical, we mean, are they exactly the same kind of idea? Um, and so, and if we have an idea of white and an idea of black, and we perceive them together, then Locke says, we perceive without further ado, without putting anything in between them, without any medium in between them, we perceive right away that they are not the same kind of idea. One of them is the idea of white and the other is the idea of black. And so we know that white is not black. That's an example of the kind of knowledge we can have under this heading. Um, um, and we know this, Locke says, by something like seeing. Um, so on page 468, book four, chapter one, section four, This then is the first agreement or disagreement which the mind perceives in its ideas, which it always perceives at first sight. So um, it's, we do something like just seeing that they're not, that white and black are not the same idea. Now, um, um, in what way is it like seeing and in what way is it not like seeing? It's again, perhaps is a figurative use of language. Um, uh, or I guess I should say, you know, uh, it's kind of it's supposed to be kind of like seeing it. It's clearly different from seeing in two respects. So what in one respect, it's not as good as what we call seeing, I think. Because um, here's another place where he talks about it. The mind clearly and infallibly perceives each idea to agree with itself and to be what it is, and all distinct ideas to disagree. That is, the one not to be the other. And this it does without pains, labor, or deduction. But at first view, by its natural power of perception and distinction, remember that those are two different operations of the mind, according to Locke: perception and distinction. Or what did he call it before? Uh, discernment, I think, is what he called it before in Book Two. Those are two different operations of the mind. In order to um, um, to know that white is not black, it's not enough that I perceive both white and black. I have to discern between them. Um, so, um, and whereas perception is completely passive or mostly passive anyway, according to Locke, right? That is, I have no choice as to whether I will perceive a certain simple idea when its cause is present. Uh, the other operations that come after that are things that I have to actively do. They don't just happen to me. So um, this might help to explain the apparent, apparent to me anyway, 
tension between what he's saying here and what he said earlier about how infants at first have their ideas completely confused until they learn to distinguish them. Right? It's true. As soon as we um, carry out the operation of discernment, we see right away that white is not black, but we don't automatically do that. Um, in any case, be that as it may, um, you might ask, well, uh, is that, that kind of language knowledge doesn't sound very exciting. Does this kind of agreement or disagreement involve any other kind of knowledge? And I think the answer is, disappointingly, that no, this is, this is the only kind of example, according to Locke. Um, I mean, another type of example you might think would go here would be, although this is still not very exciting, would be something like gold is yellow, assuming yellow is part of my idea of gold. That, you might think that was an example of identity and diversity. Um, um, some philosophers would say it's the principle of identity by which we know that all gold is yellow in that case or something like that. Um, Locke, I think, does not uh, categorize even that kind of knowledge under this. He discusses it later in the chapter on trivial propositions. That would be an example of a trivial proposition. Um, but I think he considers it to be a trivial example of the second kind of knowledge rather than an example of this kind of knowledge. And that's why here, when he discusses identity and diversity at the beginning of book four, he says, that all our knowledge of this kind is merely negative. Right? That what we know by it is that, for example, white is not black. Um, crucial, maybe, to have this kind of knowledge. If we didn't know this, we couldn't get anywhere, according to Locke. Um, but as I said, and in principle, we can have lots and lots of it, right? This is the one kind of knowledge that we can have tons and tons of because for any two ideas that are not the same idea, we can know for sure that they're not the same idea. But uh, as I said, it's not very exciting. Um, and in particular, uh, at least with the ideas of secondary qualities, it doesn't tell us anything much about things. Right? Because to know that white is not black um, means that um, causing white is not the same quality as causing black. But remember, we just we don't know what, if any, structure in the object corresponds to that difference. That's what makes them secondary qualities. So we don't actually learn anything about the identity and diversity of things, of real powers in the object by the identity and diversity of simple ideas, at least insofar as they're ideas of secondary qualities. Okay, that's number one. Number two, which is a lot more interesting, is the example of, is the, um, um, what Locke calls relation, Identi uh, agreement and disagreement in relation, or I think by relation, maybe is the right way to understand this. This is an L. Okay. okay. Um, so, um, This is about what you might call the qualitative agreement and disagreement of ideas. And that's why I attach this to Kant's category of quality um, rather than Kant's category of relation, which is confusing. But in any case, this is about what you might call the qualitative agreement and disagreement of ideas in the sense that um, you can take two ideas that are not the same idea, but you can ask, well, but do they nevertheless have something in common with each other? Are they related to each other in some way? 
And the relation is basically going to be one of similarity or dissimilarity or equality or inequality. Um, so I think um, uh, this kind of knowledge is what Locke thinks mathematics consists of. So in his example, which I'm, I hope to discuss in detail a little bit later, but his example that he keeps coming back to about the angles, uh, the interior angles of a triangle adding up to two right angles, that is to 180 degrees. Um, what that means is the idea of two right angles is not the same as the idea of the three interior angles of a triangle. Those are two different complex ideas, right? So by identity and difference, these are right angles. I guess you don't have to really draw it twice, of course. If one's a right angle, the other one has to be. Um, so um, these ideas are not the same at all, but the demonstration that this one equals this one is a demonstration that they have that kind of agreement. They're agreed, they're, uh, agreed by a relation of equality. They have the same amount of angle in them. Now, um, let's, so, so that of course is kind of exciting. We do know some interesting things this way. And um, moreover, uh, insofar as we know them about primary qualities, um, as in this example, we learn something about things from them as well, right? Because um, if uh, these ideas, although different, are necessarily equal by a visible and necessary connection, then that means that um, what causes one of them in the world, if anything, is also going to be uh, connected by a necessary connection to what causes the other one. Right, so we can conclude from this that if there is a triangle in the world and there is two right angles in the world, that the interior angles of the triangle have the same amount of something, they're equal in some respect to the two right angles. And that's why Locke says mathematics actually teaches us, gives us real knowledge and not only ideal knowledge, not only knowledge about our own ideas. Um, it's a little bit less clear what other kinds of knowledge could fit into this. It seems like the other example that Locke keeps discussing, namely of uh, moral knowledge, should also fit into this. Um, the only question is, I guess, um, whether um, there could possibly be synthetic knowledge there. Um, and I mean, I'm not sure Locke thinks there is. By, and by synthetic, again, I mean the knowledge the two ideas agree or disagree, but not because there's the exact same idea present twice. So like if you take Locke's example, so Locke's, Locke's example is there is no justice without property. And there I think he's using his use of property is a little bit shifty, um, but he, in his political works, he often uses it in a very broad sense in which everything I have a right to is my property. So that includes my own life, for example. He's not just talking about um, real property like land that can be bought and sold or even about material property like possessions, but he's talking about rights in general are, are basically prop, property means right. Having to, to have property means to have an exclusive right that other people don't have a right to interfere with, such as the right to liberty or the right to my own life. 
um, by no coincidence at all, you may recognize those three things I just talked about from the Declaration of Independence. So in any case, um, um, so when Locke says there is no justice without property, you can translate that to mean there is no justice without rights. And I think what he means is that uh, it's part of the concept, the concept of justice, the complex idea of justice, if you were to define it, means that pe everyone gets what they have a right to and not, I guess, and not, it seems like the second part is really more important, not what anyone else has a right to. <laughs> And not when anyone else has an exclusive right to. So that's what justice means. It's, you know, all philosophers when they talk about justice are somehow interpreting that one definition uh, quoted from Simonides in the Republic, that justice is giving to each the things that are due. Um, so that's Locke's interpretation of it. Justice means um, giving everyone what they have a right to and not what anyone else has a right to. And so if there are no exclusive rights, there can be no justice because by definition of justice, right? So, and it seems like all the moral demonstrations are gonna work like that. So really the conclusions are gonna be what Locke calls trivial propositions. What is it that makes it non-trivial and makes it possible for us to have real knowledge there? Um, I think the thing that's added is another thing that he says we have demonstrative knowledge of, but it's hard to understand how, the how that's supposed to work, the existence of God, right? So the thing that comes into there to, that makes it non-trivial is that, um, and by the way, I know that knowledge, that justice is something that will be rewarded according to the divine law. So I can conclude that I can't be rewarded in a certain way unless there are rights. That's the real knowledge I'm getting at. Um, okay, so it seems like although morality and mathematics may be both fall under this, morality actually, insofar as it falls under this, falls under the trivial proposition part of it. And it's only mathematics that makes use of something interesting, namely the necessary connection between distinct primary qualities, um, or distinct ideas of primary qualities. So that's number two. Number three, coexistence or necessary I'm going to spell it that way even though Locke spells it with an X connection um, so um, This type of knowledge has to do in particular with knowledge of substances. And what we're trying to know here about ideas, in what respect are we trying to, to see their agreement or disagreement with each other? Well, um, we wanna know if they agree insofar as um, the subject that has the quality that causes one of them always has the quality that causes the other one, right? So coexistence, those qualities always, or those ideas, I guess I should say, will always come together. They'll, the ideas will always exist together. Why? Because there's a necessary connection in the, the, sub, the substance that causes them. That's what we're trying to know, know in this type of knowledge. Um, and uh, you probably won't be surprised to hear that um, Locke doesn't think we have very much knowledge like this. 
right? So like when he introduces it, he seems to give an example of it. Let me go back to the document viewer, document camera. Oops, that's my eraser. Still on page 468. Book four, chapter one, section six. Thirdly, the third sort of agreement or disagreement to be found in our ideas, which the perception of the mind is employed about, is coexistence or non-coexistence in the same subject. And this belongs particularly to substances. And here's the example. Thus, when we pronounce concerning gold that it is fixed, fixed means, um, so what fixed really means is that it has a very high uh, evaporation point. But uh, what they thought it meant is that it never evaporated. <laughs> so they didn't have a hot enough thing to make it evaporate. So that's what they thought fixed means. You can melt it. I mean, it's fusible, but you can't make it disappear in a fire. It always stays there. Right? Um, anyway, so thus when we pronounce concerning gold that it is fixed, our knowledge of this truth amounts to no more but this, that fixedness or power to remain in the fire unconsumed is an idea that always accompanies and is joined with that particular sort of yellowness, weight, fusibility, malleableness, and solubility in aqua regia, which makes our complex idea signified by the word gold. So there Locke seems to say that we have this knowledge, right? We know that gold is fixed. And what do we know when we know that gold is fixed? We know that um, whatever has those qualities of yellowness, hardness, fusibility, malleability, and, uh, well, not hardness. Did I say hardness? Did he say hardness? It's not really hard. No, we didn't. Okay. Yellowness, weight, usability, malleability, and solubility in aqua regia. Um, that uh, what we know is that whatever has those qualities, that is, the qualities that cause those ideas, whatever has those qualities also has the quality of fixedness, not being consumed in the fire. So there it sounds like Locke thinks we have, he's giving an example of that kind of knowledge. He, said, he calls it knowledge there. But I think it turns out that uh, his final view on this is that um, we don't actually know it. This is a matter of probability. Um, and the reason it's a matter of probability I probably should have stayed with the document camera. Let me go right back to it. The reason it's a matter of probability only, he explains when he talks about our knowledge of substances. So um, this is book four, chapter three, section 10, page 483 in this text. This, however weighty and considerable a part soever of human science is yet very narrow and scarce any at all. The reason whereof is, but the simple ideas whereof our complex ideas of substances are made up are, for the most part, such as carry with them in their own nature no visible necessary connection or inconsistency with any other simple idea whose coexistence with them we would inform ourselves about. Right? Meaning that the ideas that we put into the complex idea of some kind of substance are mostly ideas of secondary qualities. That's what he goes on to say in section 11. 
and secondary qualities have no visible necessary connection with each other. That is, the ideas of secondary qualities have no visible necessary connection with one another. So um, we can never know, we can never perceive with certainty that those ideas agree or disagree in this way. Um, it's actually impossible for us to know that for two reasons. Number one, because we don't know what primary qualities produce those secondary qualities. And number two, because even if we did know that, we wouldn't know why they produce those ideas. Um, right? Locke says we'll never understand why a certain texture of very small parts causes the idea of yellow in us. Um, so what that means is that so far as what we want to know is what things actually, what properties actually go together in external things. What are the properties of actual um, bodies, or I guess of our own mind? That's a little bit less clear, but in any case, because he never says exactly what are the primary and secondary qualities of our mind. Um, but so uh, in any case, um, certainly with respect to external bodies, um, all we have is some kind of probability. And that means that the problem that's often attributed to Hume, called the problem of induction, is actually already in full force for Locke here with respect to that kind of knowledge, which, as he points out, is most of the kind of knowledge we want to have, right? For this coexistence can be no further known than it is perceived. And it cannot be perceived but either in particular subjects by the observation of our senses or in general by the necessary connection of the ideas themselves. This is the same alternative that Hume sets up, right? We either know by the connection of ideas or we know as a matter of fact by perceiving particulars. But what that means is that all our judgments that, for example, is very probable that all gold is fixed just amount to the fact that so far we've experienced gold a lot of times, that is we've experienced these something causing these ideas of yellowness and heaviness and fusibility and et cetera, lots of times. And so far we've always found that it's fixed. So the question um, how any amount of that can ever um, yield even a probable universal judgment is already a problem for Locke. Um, um, the only thing Locke does have, uh, not have a problem with here that Hume does would be if there's a case where we define a certain sort of substances by its primary qualities. Um, now, I mean, there's, I guess, in some sense, a lot of cases like that occurring to Locke, but they're not very interesting in this respect, right? So Locke says that we mostly classify living things by their shape. Um, and shape, that is, figure, is a primary quality. So to the extent that a human being is defined as an animal that has a certain type of shape, right? We don't all have exactly the same shape, but there's some things that we have mostly in common. Um, so anyway, assuming you can make a little sense of that issue, um, we all have the same shape. And so you can know certain things for sure about human beings, like what their interior angles add up to. So this, that kind of geometrical facts, that's not really what we wanted to know. Um, so it's not very interesting. The only, I think, interesting exception, but it's very important to Locke and probably very important to Hume that he doesn't agree about this, is body as a type of substance. 
body as a type of substance, according to Locke, is defined by solidity and extension. Um, and we, there is a visible and necessary connection between those ideas and other ideas. In particular, we can know for sure that something that is solid and extended can move something else that's solid and extended by impulse. So in that third type of knowledge, um, there isn't very much, but this is to say, you know, this one doesn't have very much, but it does have mathematics and ethics. <laughs> and this one doesn't have very much, but it does have physics. Right? For a mechanist, the whole content of physics is basically that one thing that we can know about the sort of substance we call body because of the necessary connection of simple primary ideas of primary qualities, namely that bodies can push each other. Okay, that's number three. Number four, oh, do I want to? I still want to talk about the difference between intuitive and demonstrative knowledge. I think it's more important than I get to that. I think I may talk about this a little bit more next time when we talk about uh, Locke's proof of the existence of God. Um, but This is supposed to be about whether our ideas agree with things or not. Now, uh, right away, that's really weird because we said that knowledge was all about agreement and disagreement of ideas with each other, we thought. I mean, look, the argument for it was that all I can contemplate immediately is my own ideas. So knowledge has to be about agreement and disagreement of my own ideas, at least immediately. But all of a sudden, we get to this type of knowledge, which is somehow about a comparison between my idea and something else. And how that's supposed to work and how much of it we have um, is difficult to understand. Um, there's really only three cases that Locke talks about. The first is that he says we have intuitive knowledge of our own existence. The second is that he says we have demonstrative knowledge of the existence of God. And the third is that he says, we have this other kind of knowledge called um, sensible knowledge. I think that's the, something like that. Sens sensible. Um, yeah, sensible knowledge. We have this other kind of knowledge that he didn't tell us about before called sensible knowledge, by which we know of the existence of the immediate objects of the senses. Um, so possibly it's in that case where there's actually some kind of um, exception to the, the rule that all knowledge is about agreement and disagreement of ideas. And maybe he didn't mention it before because it's, and it's an example of particular knowledge, not universal knowledge. Universal knowledge must all be intuitive or demonstrative, but this sensible knowledge is something else. Um, Okay, uh, you know, I could say more about that, but what I would mostly would say about that is that I don't quite understand what Locke means. So maybe it's better that I go on. Oh, now I see there's a question now. Question. What's the definition of sensible knowledge again? Well, uh, I don't know if he gives a formal definition of it, but he says sensible knowledge is the knowledge that we have of the existence of the, of the immediate the objects of our senses, of the things that we're actually perceiving right now, right? So like an example of sensible knowledge is that uh, I know this marker is that I'm looking at is here. Um, 
which uh, is consistent with knowing very little about what the marker is. What it really amounts to is knowing that whatever causes certain ideas in me is here. But that's still a lot. It's enough that Barclay is going to say that not only don't we have that, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> right? But, um, but it's limited. It's limited to only the things that I'm perceiving right now. So and I, as I said, it's not universal. It's not like markers exist. It's this, this here, whatever is causing these ideas in me now exists. That's what sensible knowledge is supposed to be. And he doesn't introduce it in the beginning of the chapter and it suddenly comes out of nowhere later on. Okay, um, I just have five minutes left and I do want to discuss demonstrative versus intuitive knowledge, or especially how Locke thinks about demonstration, just briefly. So, um, and so here is the example of, I don't even remember, did I do this proof in this course before? I'm not confused. I know I did it last quarter in, some, in the comp course, I think. Uh, it's the demonstration that the angles, the interior angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. Even if I did it before, I'm going to do it again because it's quick. How can you demonstrate this? Well, okay, so first of all, here's the triangle. Here's its interior angles. How am I gonna prove this? So I draw a line through the base of the triangle here, and then I draw a parallel to that line through the apex of the triangle here. And then I say, well, uh, alternating angles between parallels are equal. This is roughly the way Euclid proves it. It's actually, I rearranged it a little bit from the way Euclid proves it to make it easier to connect to lock, but I, I think they're basically the same proof. Um, so I say, oh, alternating angles between parallels are the same, so this angle is the same as that angle. Oh, and also this angle is the same as this angle. Oh, but these three angles add up to two right angles. Therefore, these three angles add up to two right angles. That's the proof. Do people understand the proof? Is there a question about the proof? Okay, so, um, so this is how Locke thinks this works. And I, I think he's thinking of demonstration in general as being somehow very much like this. Uh, possibly, I know I've read, I think I saw this in Reed actually, this criticism of Flock that uh, he was misled by thinking all demonstration is like mathematical demonstration. I don't know. But anyway, th this, is, this is the way he understands this as working. Um, he says, why can't, why isn't this knowledge intuitive? It's not intuitive, he says, because the mind can't juxtapose the idea of the three interior angles of a triangle with the idea of two right angles. So the mind can't juxtapose the idea of the three interior angles of a triangle with any one or two angles, is the way he puts it. And I think he's, what he's thinking is that Literally, you know, here's the idea of two right angles. Here's the idea of the three angles of a triangle. There's no way for me to move these angles around so that I can compare them to this sum of two right angles. Whenever I put one of them here, the other one's always going to be off there. So that's, that's why the demonstration is not intuitive. So what I want, again, the conclusion is going to be the agreement of these ideas. So the way the demonstration is going to work, that is, sorry, the agreement of two ideas, namely the sum of these angles and the sum of these angles. And the way the proof is going to work is not by starting with axioms and deducing consequences. Locke actually thinks that axioms or maxims are useless. The way the demonstration is going to work is going to be starting by one idea, finding other ideas that I can compare it to until I get through a chain to one I can compare to this. 
So the beginning, that's why the beginning and the end of the demonstration are ideas, not propositions. But the conclusion of the demonstration is that the ideas at the two ends agree with each other. And so in this case, again, the way it works is that I start off with this idea. I find I can't compare it directly to this, but I see, oh, I can compare this directly to this. These, I think Locke is thinking that this is intuitive. That means that this particular instance of the parallel postulate is intuitive for those who are interested in such things, right? It means he thinks that I can see intuitively that there's just one way to draw a parallel through here. And it's the way such that these angles could be moved into each other. So um, I see that intuitively. I see this intuitively. I see the relationship between this, this, and this, and the two right angles intuitively. So I started with this, this, and this. And by interposing these intermediate ideas, I was able to compare this, this, and this to this and this. And that's how the demonstration works. And now uh, I am out of time, so I'll see you. Wait. Wait. Can Wait, I get them a message? OK, now Margaret wants to give you a message. Where should I stand? Do you want them to see you or your message? Me. Then you should stand I'm here. I'm going to tell them. Actually, no, because I want to write it. OK, but write it quickly, because I already kept them over the time. Oh, OK. <laughs> Can I have your pen? OK. I want you to follow on TikTok, hippie, hippies, bud. Yes, so that would be at sign hippies bud. Yeah, I already told them that before, although that was a lecture that wasn't recorded, so maybe not all of you saw it. Okay, there you have it. Follow on TikTok, hippies bud. And it's my dad's TikTok. It's my TikTok, but the only TikTok there so far was actually put up by Mark. That's why she found this. Okay, on that note, then I'll see you uh, next week. Today's Wednesday. Okay, fine.